Uh, and I watched a lot of throwdown round on an airplane, and it was cutting in and out, so I appreciate everybody keeping me updated on Twitter. It was a doozy, and there's only four teams left standing for championship weekend. In the NFC, woo-woo, the top two seeds advanced, kind of as expected. The Eagles host the Niners at 3 Eastern next Sunday. Hopefully Marissa survived. I haven't heard from Marissa since the game, so I hope she's okay. Are you alive, McBride? Let me know. Uh, I want to hear from Eagles fans. How are you feeling this morning? How How is that that hangover? still in full effect this morning. Um, this will be San Francisco, by the way. How about this? 18th appearance in a conference championship game all time. That's more than any other team in NFL history. And then over on the AFC side, dun, 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 dun. at 6.30 Eastern, there will be no neutral site, as TikTok's football boyfriend Burrow said. Better send those refunds. Love that. The Chiefs host the Bengals. Have you heard that before? Yeah, a couple times. Three, in fact. At Arrowhead, that's happening for the second straight season. It's also the fifth straight year. we got to give some love here to the Chiefs. Fifth straight year that the AFC Championship is held in Kansas City. That is legend stuff. That is dynasty stuff. Just an unreal accomplishment by Andy Reid and company. Okay. Where do we start? We start with the game that was played last night, right? No, 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 it's my show. And we decide to start where we want. Don't sue me, whoever made up this song. I might do this for the whole song. Okay, fine, I won't. But to use the parlance of Cincy great Chris Collinsworth. Here's a team that shot up to snowy Buffalo. Buffalo, who I've never seen a team universally chosen to win a Super Bowl in my lifetime, in the beginning of the season, in the off season, and everything in between. They shot up there and didn't win. They dominated this team from start to finish 27-10. And I could be, listen, and I have it in me. Let's, we all know it. I could be Petty Murphy up here and start pulling out receipt after receipts, the CVS the ones. Uh, but it's only an hour-long show, people. I mean, could I dig into a division rival all-time great saying the Bengals have zero chance to win this game? A friend of the show? I could, I could do that. I could spend my time doing that. Or could I call out a prominent New York City radio ding-dong who said the Bengals are a flawed team? that they may not even win their division, that the AFC is a two-dog race, it's the Bills and the Chiefs? Sure, I could do that, but we have time for that in the offseason. We have time for that later this week. Today, we celebrate what was a near flawless performance. Today is for the Hayden Hursts and the Lou Anarumos and the, the Eli Apples. I mean, who saw that coming? So let's go. And Joe Burrow, who turned in another incredible playoff performance, okay? Coming through in the clutch, clutch once again. And as great as he was, and as great as Mixon was, he looked unreal yesterday, and we were all worried about the reshuffling of that offensive line. Andrew Whitworth's like, see, we don't need them, we don't need us. It was only possible because of the shuffling and the chemistry or, or whatever went down with this O-line, down three starters, they stepped up and completely controlled the line of scrimmage. If you look at what happened here, the Bengals rushed for 172 yards on over five yards per carry, and on 39 dropbacks, Joe Burrow was sacked just once and pressured just three times. Jackson Carmen, Cordell Volson, Ted Karras, Mac Sharping, Hakeem Adeniji, these guys were picked apart and questioned all week long. How are you going to do it? I'm here buying flights for Andrew Whitworth. I feel like such an idiot. Buying flights. You got to get there. You got to get there. What are they going to do? How are they going to protect Joe Burrow? So um, I want to make sure those names are heard and celebrated this morning. They could not have played better. Those rushing numbers are insane. And we also got to give love to Coach Lou. We need to coach Lou Dance. Coach Lou needs to get a TikTok, all of that. This defensive coordinator needs to be head coach somewhere. I'm not going to say that too loudly because I don't want him to leave Cincinnati. But all last week I talked about what he's done as far as game planning against Patrick Mahomes. He went 3-0 and against the Chiefs. Of course, he's a huge part of that. And, and he put together another masterpiece against another beast of a quarterback yesterday afternoon. The Bengals defense held the Bills to just 10 points. 10 points, people. Their lowest output of the entire season. Josh Allen posted 
a 68 passer rating, his second worst of the entire year, and the Bengals running backs combined for just 37 yards on the ground. Coach Lou, and whatever this ability is, this knack for game planning against high-powered, versatile offenses is really stunning, and it needs to be taken into account here. And I'm glad I see that he's getting some love. Mina Kimes gives him love. That's a huge platform. But there need to be more people talking about him as one of the elite coordinators in this league who has the potential to take over as a head coach with one of these vacancies. Uh, We have to celebrate the fans as well. I was so sad I couldn't be there. I'm here in New York City. I was flying here during most of the game. I heard you. I heard you on my banged up recycled headphones on my JetBlue flight that was going in and out. I heard you. I heard the who days. There were bar takeovers. I was seeing that all over Twitter and Instagram. There were the chants in the fourth quarter. That doesn't happen there. Not in Buffalo. That is a supreme fan base. That's the one you're trying to take off the power rankings of the most loyal, crazy, nutty fan base. And you went in there and I could hear you. That's amazing. And you get another loud one next. You get the Chiefs. 3-0, I don't care. And no neutral site. We'll get into that all week, of course. Today's for celebrating, and I hope everybody there is. And just remember, better send those refunds. And the most important thing is, they got to play us. Let's move on. All right, let's go to Dallas. Who do they think will beat the Bengals? Who do they? Who do they? Who do they think will beat the Bengals? Love it. Wholesome. We're loving it for the Bengals. we got to talk about what happened with the Niners last night. Uh, most shows starting with this game. Uh, with good reason, I cannot wait to have Chris Carter on to talk about this. The Niners grind it out a win. There's no other way to put it here. 19-12 over the Cowboys. And it was far from their more dominant or prettier performances of the season, but it really did seem like everybody on that team stepped up when the game was hanging in the balance in the second half to get the job done. And we should start by giving some credit to the Niners' pass defense. I talked a lot last week about how they'd been bottom five in pretty much every category over the final month of the season, how it might be an area Dallas could exploit. They have CeeDee Lamb. They can do it if Dallas played like they did the week before. They were on point last night. Shut up, Kay Adams. They intercepted Dak Prescott twice. They held him to just 206 yards and one touchdown pass on the day, and it was so impressive, even more impressive considering that they usually, you know, the Niners' pass rush, they're always on point. They only had one sack and four quarterback hits on the day. So what does that do but stress out and panic the secondary and put more on their plate than usual, and they held up and delivered. And then there was George Kittle. I mean, as if the Niners needed another iconic playoff catch. What are we talking about here? He hauls this in. Acrobatic, juggling beauty. Oh, here we go. Oh, what? What? Unbelievable. This sparks the Niners' only touchdown drive of the day late in the third quarter. And I don't see anyone dubbing it the catch part for yet, but I think it has to be under consideration. This was absolutely ridiculous and changed the game. So congrats to Kittle, who led the way for the Niners, 95 yards, rare form uh, with all of his antics as well, what's up, or whatever they were doing with their tongues out and just all of the excitement he was talking to, the sky cam, all of that. Uh, But even in the excitement of that win and another Niners trip to the NFC title game, there were questions about how conservatively the Niners played offensively, something I pointed out last week. I was worried about Shanahan stick to your guns. They scored fewer than 20 for the first time since Brock Purdy took over. Shanahan. I can't say this for a fact. He, he didn't say it this way in his post game either. S- to me, seemed a little reluctant to put the game completely in the hands of his quarterback early on. Greg Olson mentioned it during the broadcast. I, I did. You guys have questions about it? Watching it unfold, let me know at Up and Adam Show. Um, and Kyle, what, of course, was asked about it right out the gates in his press conference. Let's take a listen. We knew how good their defense was too, and we felt we really had to run the ball just to negate their pass rush because how special of a pass rush they have and um, for us to end up getting over 30 carries when you're only averaging like three I think we had three five um, just shows how good the team was doing okay that's a reasonable explanation for sure I know it's a chess match with his former boss Dan Quinn on the other side I, I imagine you know a guy who knows what he likes to do offensively better than anyone, I would say this. If the Niners are going to get the job done and bring that Lombardi back to the Bay, they're going to have to lean on Brock a little bit more than they did yesterday. In Philly, 
the way Jalen looks, the way that whole team looks, that's all I'll say. But congrats to the Niners for taking on the Cowboys. I'm going to ask Chris Carter about the Cowboys very shortly, so don't go anywhere and, and stay tuned for that. But, uh, you know, we got to talk about this Eagles team that they're going to face, right? They're going to host the NFC title game against the Niners after taking down the Giants 38-7 to on Saturday night. So there was concern about how healthy Jalen was going to look. Was he going to look 100%? He even admitted leading up to the game his shoulder wasn't totally there. I think the issue was pretty much put to bed, people, with how he looked. He came out the gates hot. He carved up the Giants for three total touchdowns and was as efficient as can be. This was as good as the Eagles offense has looked all year. And Nick Sirianni didn't hold back when talking about his quarterback's impact after the game. To have him out, to have him out there is like, I know this is high praise, but to have him out there is like having, I, nah, I shouldn't even go there, but like he's having like Michael Jordan out there. Like he's your leader. He's your leader. He's your guy. He's your, like, like that's, hopefully that's the biggest respect I can pay to him uh, compare, <laughs> comparing to his ability to be in on the field uh, to, a, to a Michael Jordan type. I'm, I recall the conversation I had with TJ Edwards last week about his coach, and I watched his coach on NFL Films talk about Bill Belichick and his demeanor and him being so stoic on the sideline and Nick Sirianni. He's like, I want to be that. Nobody wants you to be that. You were the star in this game, and it was amazing, and he's calling him Michael Jordan, and while Hurt's impact was undeniable, I don't want to lose sight either of what this offensive line did. Lane Johnson, another guy, banged up, returns to the lineup, and the Eagles obliterated the Giants up front. The birds averaged over six yards per carry on the ground. Do you understand? They punched in three touchdowns. They rushed for 268 on the night. And that's the most they put up on the ground in a playoff game since the 1949 NFL Championship game. 1949! I feel like we have this debate every year. Oh, uh, do you really want the bye week? I don't know, momentum. Do you really want to rest, guys? Don't you think it'll make them rusty and whatever? Like, can we table that? Can that be not a thing anymore? Because the one seed, clearly critical for the Eagles to give Hurts the extra week to get ready and to get Lane Johnson back. Those two things mattered so much. And at this stage of the season, everybody's banged up. So to get an extra week has become more vital than ever. And after a bunch of late season injuries, people... Uh, th this sent this team into a bit of a lull. There was concern. Philly is flying as high as they have all year heading into this NFC title game, and it is going to be a heavyweight battle. All right, which game should we get to next? Let's go KC. KC uh, and their fans got th the scare of a lifetime. Patrick Mahomes, of course, taken out of the game in the second quarter. He didn't want to leave. He was really demonstrative and very adamant about it. And it turns out he had a high ankle sprain, right? Chad Henney, anything can happen. He held on the fort for 13 snaps under center. So much credit to Andy Reid adjusting as he did. And Mahomes returned at halftime, comes out and leads KC to a drama, drama dramatic win, uh, and a chance for this rematch against the Bengals. Patrick clearly not right when he came back to start the second half, but it was one of those Mahomes, tough, gutsy performances. Anybody that knows Mahomes was tweeting about it. He's tough, he wants to play. Uh, and it was capped by what you just saw. This, I think, what I think we just saw, I actually didn't see it. The, did we just show the touchdown to Marquez about the scaling? Was that it? There we go. Let's take another look at this. I mean, this is gutsy. Are you kidding me? This is a way to add to a remarkable legacy that he's already carved out in Kansas City. And he deserves all the credit for this, uh, for what he was able to do in that game, essentially on one leg. I have to make sure Andy Reid, Eric Bieniemy, and Chad Henney get some credit as well here this morning. And I'm sure Kansas City Chiefs fans feel the same way. Mahomes forced to leave the game in the second quarter. Henney got handed the ball his own two-yard line, backed up in his own end zone, and this is how the Chiefs responded. They ripped off, look at this, 12 plays. Okay, it's a 12 play 98 yard drive, okay? Over six minutes, including six first down pickups. What? Capped by a Henny touchdown pass to who else? Travis Kelsey, who somehow is, that's what we have to ask Chris Carter. Are you kidding me? How do you go uncovered the entire game? It was so stupid. The play calling and the adjustments on the fly from Reed, from the enemy, brilliant. And credit to Henny, because you can't, I mean, it's not all to read. He executed that in the craziest conditions, off the bench, cold, to get it done. Uh, and Mahomes agrees. Some big throws versus some pressure looks. I mean, they brought some heat whenever he came in the game. Um, and he made some big throws and was able to get us into the end zone. And that was a, a big point in the game because it was able to, 
that gave me the ability to kind of come back and rest and wait till halftime until we kind of retaped and did everything we could to get me ready to go in the second half. I love that he said that you cannot ask for more out of your backup quarterback or from Travis Kelsey, who caught four passes from Henny on that drive, including the touchdown. He had two scores just under 100 yards, hauling in 14 grabs. That is a record. He set the NFL playoff record for catches by a tight end in the world where Rob Gronkowski played in basically every game, a playoff situation for years and years and years. All that being said, you can't, you can't not be concerned about the injury going forward. High ankle sprain equals no bueno. It costs players multiple weeks, usually. I'm not a doctor, but even hearing that, and I know that he wasn't, he didn't leave on a crutch or had nothing going on. He wore the same shoes that he wore into the thing. That's all fine. And that's, you know, what is, what is Mac, if you call it, vitamin T, vitamin, vitamin Toradol? I've had Toradol. It, it's great. It works. I'm not an NFL player, but I assume it wears off in a couple of hours. Uh, I think the fact, the, the, the thing that sucks the most is that it's on his plant leg, right? We, we all saw how he could barely push off of it on Saturday. So he said, and of course, he wants to play through it. Uh, and he's played in every freaking AFC championship game since being a starter in the National Football League. Think about that. But with, when it's on that leg, you got to think it's going to lose a bit of the deep ball action and reduce his mobility a little bit. And that was probably going to affect how the Chiefs run their offense. Luckily, they have Andy Reid who can probably figure it out. But I'm interested to see what Chris Carter thinks on how they can adjust or if it's as major of an issue uh, for next Sunday. So, yes, we have you know enough of me here. We got one of the best to ever do it. One of the best wide receivers in NFL history joining us. We are honored to be graced with the presence of Hall of Famer Chris Carter. Man, we got to talk about Chase and Burrow next. 